Hey everyone, so today I want to talk about um, the link between hard work and uh, wealth, or the generating of wealth. I think most people uh, anecdotally accept the idea that um, if you work hard, you can make it. If you work hard, you will get money. If you work hard, you will um, be able to live off of uh, the earnings that you get. Um, you know, even to the point where work hard, working hard will give you a great, a great amount of wealth. Unfortunately, this is not the case, and that idea um, by itself, I believe, is to borrow a term that I don't like at all, problematic. Or let's say that it is inaccurate and therefore um, can cause problems and lead people down like a, a wrong um, path of thought towards trying to gain their goals or uh, what have you, or think economically. So I ran across a meme that it was kind of a dig at that um, false premise. And so ideally, you know, the words and, that it uses and the order that it puts them in, I technically agree with. Um, and I'll show you the image right now. So we have women, probably in Africa, um, doing hard physical labor, uh, carrying bundles of sticks down the road, probably to uh, provide uh, firewood or building materials for the family, uh, their tribe, their, um, you know, their village or whatnot. Uh, and then underneath it has a quote saying that, um, if hard work, something to the effect, if hard work and enterprise alone brought wealth, these women would be millionaires. Um, so right, yes, it's attacking the idea that hard work in and of itself will make you wealthy, which is, yes, inaccurate. Unfortunately, I believe that the conclusion that the author of this image and quote combination here is inaccurate and not the conclusion that you should conclude. So let me elaborate. When I look at it, and when I think when other free market um, believers and, and uh, thinkers look at it, they'll look at it and say, okay, well, we have these women here putting a lot of effort into um, providing for their families, uh, for providing building materials or whatever that wood is going to happen. And then there's probably other difficult jobs that they engage in to provide for their family. And there's a couple things that we would identify as uh, getting in their way of being more self-sufficient, be able to accrue more uh, wealth, and basically the ability to live easily or more easily and have a higher quality of life. The first one that I would point out is that the labor that they're doing is uh, very, very unskilled and very inefficient. They're relying on, oh, in addition, their labor is only going to benefit a few people. And for a couple reasons, this is a, very, is a limiting factor for how much wealth they can accrue doing that kind of labor. But first, uh, yes, their labor is primarily limited by their physical strength and maybe the uh, simple tools that they use to cut down those branches or whatever simple tools they use in whatever labor they do in addition to what's pictured. So not a lot gets done. 
human hands and strength, unfortunately, is pretty limited. And, uh, you know, for the longest time, humanity lived in abject poverty before mechanization. So their lib labor is limited by uh, their abilities and their simple tools, which limits them. The work that they're doing is very unskilled and therefore not necessarily very economically valuable. While it's very valuable to the family, um, it's not valuable to a lot of other people. And that's my last point. Uh, it doesn't improve the lives of a lot of other people. And kind of the, it kind of plays into the economies of scale, both in that the more you produce, the easier it is to produce, and the more you produce, the more you can sell, the more profits you make. If your labor doesn't interact with many other people and you can't trade for uh, shared value in money or barter or whatever, you can't accrue very much um, you know, stored wealth out of that kind of labor. Secondly, obviously they're living in probably a third world country. My guess would be Africa. I could be wrong. And so there's a number of things that limit their ability to be uh, economically valuable and to accrue wealth like I've been talking about. Namely, the government is probably highly corrupt and it probably limits a lot of uh, economic interactions there's probably very little to no free market and there's probably no res no real respect for property rights there's probably uh, no real uh, or substantial like court system and um, obviously there's no existing capital and equipment there to increase the uh, productivity of the people there. And therefore, obviously, the wealth in the entire country is limited by these factors. So when myself or other free market supporters look at that, we would say, oh, well, um, it's unfortunate that people have to work this hard and uh, reap so little out of their labor, we should work on, or they sh you know, I don't know <laughs> who, have, who, you know, who has the power to help them improve the environment that their economy is in, but they need free trade. They need um, private property. They need, um, you know, like a stable marketplace, which they probably don't have. And these things can be affected by, um, admittedly, the United States government does some pretty underhanded things or allows underhanded things to happen in these third world countries, whether it's um, corporations and businesses to have, uh, and even the local government allows it, allows companies to come in and take advantage of the workers or, um, you know, operate in kind of a, a monopoly or pay the workers very poorly or, and not work, let the workers, um, you know, organize and try to, um, you know, communicate with the businesses and coordinate, uh, you know, increased earnings and stuff like that. And there's also the issue of foreign aid and the West dumping a lot of money and products and food on those local market markets and basically driving out any producer, any local producers out of business because they can't compete with free. Unfortunately, a lot of the humanitarian effort and charity that goes into these places with good effort um, has a lot of negative impacts in these areas. And so that's the large ball of ideas and realities that um, I think 
negatively impact the people in these areas and limit their ability to engage in labor that is more economically valuable and in the long run lets everybody become more wealthy, right? Now, when a leftist or progressive or a Democrat looks at this, you know, maybe even some Republicans, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to keep track of what these people believe anymore. But uh, I'm going to make some assumptions about uh, what they would interpret uh, this whole meme package to be. Uh, I pulled the, this graphic off of a, uh, a liberal uh, Facebook page, so I don't feel too bad weaving a couple other uh, liberal progressive beliefs into kind of the premises and the conclusions that I believe the author wants people to get when they read this. So the leftist or the, pre or the progressive might look at it and see it more as a failure of uh, capitalism or the markets, even though there is no shred of free market capitalism or free markets in those areas, they might assume that that is a uh, inherent flaw in the environment these women are, are working in. And they might feel, um, you know, a level of uh, resentment towards it because unfortunately, capitalists and free market thinkers have done a uh, Maybe they have done a poor. They haven't done a poor job of trying to spread uh, their knowledge and opinions and views of the world. Maybe just people don't listen, and they don't uh, care enough to get the subtleties. But um, so they look at it and be like, "Oh, all these free marketers are telling us that hard work will get you everywhere you want to go." when that's just part of the picture, you know, because like I said before, it's hard work. It's doing something economically valuable to a lot of other people. It's having uh, free markets and property rights in your local area. It's um, a, host, a whole host of things. But so look at it and, and see a sort of um, immoral situation. Uh, maybe even a, a sort of oppression or, um, wow, I can't think of the word, uh, where one party takes advantage of the other party. Um, exploitation, yeah. <laughs> and so they're, they would probably jump past all of the pieces that create this situation and just want to pass like a law or just pick out one solution to um, the problem, regardless or not, if it, if it addresses like the, the lower level um, issues of the whole place, of the whole situation. And now I can't help but tie all of that to how they view poverty in the United States and also um, low-income, low-skilled workers. Sorry about the noise, it's storming here pretty hard and that's the uh, the storm siren, I believe. Hopefully I don't lose power. So instead of recognizing the building blocks of creating wealth for people. They want to make the quick, easy solution, whether it's raising the minimum wage or demanding a living wage for all workers, regardless of what they do and how much economic value they bring to the table. And uh, maybe to go off on a little tangent, I see a connection to the labor theory of value as it is uh, created by Karl Marx. Now, I'm not 
fully versed in Karl Marx and the labor theory of value because I don't study retarded things. But from what I understand and how it applies to some of the zeitgeist, some of the underlying premises of uh, a lot of people running around, the theory says that the value of a product or service is heavily influenced, if not completely influenced, by the amount of work that went into it. And so that's um, to say that uh, it's not necessarily the value of the um, product or service at the end of uh, people freely choosing how much they want to pay for it. It's the work that went, on the, went in on the back end. Whether or not it's valued when it's actually out on the market, <laughs> it's kind of got the, hor the cart before the horse, and they're trying to say, oh, well, just working on, you know, the work is what's valuable. And of course, that's insane because value is subjective. The value of labor is subjective. The value of products and services are subjective. And so trying to build units of value through hours worked or how much work has been done or whatever is uh, to work at the at the issue of pricing and value from a completely incorrect angle. But that being said, um, the desire to increase the minimum wage or to have a living wage, regardless of the work you do, is a uh, similar premise where the, val where the value is placed on the work itself. It doesn't matter if you dig ditches, it doesn't matter if you clean theaters, it doesn't matter if you make sandwiches for a living. Um, you are, your employer owes you X number of dollars because whatever, whatever reasons, I don't know. And there's a lot of studies and a lot of, you know, it's funny how they use statistics to argue that like, oh, well, if, um, you know, minimum wage had been tracking with inflation, you know, minimum wage would be this high without asking, why do we have inflation? Why is our money losing value so fast? Um, you know, why is the Federal Reserve destroying a currency? And, you know, <laughs> uh, but that, that is another tangent. But so it's, um, so while <laughs> uh, I'm good at uh, looking at things and then <laughs> shoving a ton of ideas into it. And that's kind of, I think, uh, what happened when I saw this uh, this graphic here. But I think it's it's very important to talk about these kinds of things because um, the obviously these kinds of graphics and ideas permeate through um, society. And we don't um, know enough. We're not taught in public schools and, you know, a lot of people don't care enough about getting in the, into the nitty gritty portions of um, how economies work and how economics works and, um, you know, how the best methods and the best tools and blocks that you need in order to create markets and societies and economies that help everybody um, it's much easier to interpret, oh, these people are working hard, therefore they deserve this, without even considering, um, you know, what the market values their work as, what pretty much everybody else in the marketplace values their work as, which is a much better indicator of uh, if what they're doing is helping the most people or not. Unfortunately, um, this whole liberal and progressive uh, thought cloud also protects and justifies poverty in the United States. Now, the government has done many terrible things to the economy, and that's hurt a lot of people, 
and I understand that, and I don't blame them for it, but the United States is mechanized, highly mechanized. Uh, we have free education until through high school. Um, you know, there's still a, a pretty good amount of mobility between classes. Um, you know, goods and services here are relatively cheap, depending on where you live. Poverty in the United States, to a great extent, is self-imposed. Now that's barring uh, mental illness and uh, you know disabilities, but by and large, wittingly or unwittingly, the choices people make land them in poverty or not. And of course, it's it's tied to IQ, and you can we can have this whole debate about IQ levels and um, how that affects your quality of life and your ability to earn money throughout your life, but. Um, let's just stick with <laughs> everybody has free will. Let's not dip into determinism at all. As Thomas Sowell has said, I believe it was Thomas Sowell, one of my favorite economists who happens to be black, so you can't call him racist. He said the best way to avoid poverty is to do three things. Uh, finish high school work full-time, and do not have children outside of wedlock. Those three things, statistically, you jump through those hoops, you will reach the middle class. So yeah, um, we don't help the poor by assuming that they're worth more than they're worth. We don't help the poor by getting all morally outraged by the wages that they earn as they are negotiated between them and their employer and the people that buy and use their services um, or the end products of their labor. Um, all those serve to indicate to people what's valuable and what's not valuable and how to better earn money and to serve other people. Well, that was very long-winded. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you later.